Thank you so much. What a joy. Thank you. Stephen, uh, yeah, you got to lubricate the movement, right? <laughs> a beer co-op. Now we're talking. <laughs> Progress. Well, this is the very terrific uh, work that she does. We've got a saying in Texas that the rooster crows, but the hen delivers the goods. <laughs> Well, it just makes me uh, happier than a flea at a dog show to be standing up here <laughs> looking out at all you feisty, uh, forward-looking cooperatistas, you corporate butt-kickers and de democracy builders, you grassroots agitators for America's progressive values of economic fairness, social justice, equal opportunity for all people. That's really what we represent. That's really what we stand for in America uh, and, uh, and what you stand for in in the sense of uh, actually uh, representing it. Uh, so it's a joy for me to join you here uh, in uh, the chill of summer in San Francisco <laughs> <laughs> as you gather uh, for this confab to strategize, uh, organize, and mobilize uh, to democratize capital and to create a more cooperative uh, world uh, in the process. It's exciting for me uh, to be here with so many of you who are doing so much. Uh, and basically, I travel these uh, 1,200 miles or so and 40 degrees Fahrenheit uh, <laughs> from Austin, Texas, uh, to salute you. Uh, and and uh, for, for really salute you for having the gumption and the guts, uh, for having the, uh, uh, the creativity and the commitment uh, to challenge the powers that be on behalf of the powers that ought to be, the ordinary workaday people in this uh, country, uh, the, the workaday majority. I, I can testify uh, from experience uh, that challenging the powers that be is never, never easy at all. Power bites back. Uh, Woodrow Wilson said when he first came to Washington, uh, if you want to make enemies, try to change something. Uh, it's not easy. Get the feeling like that guy that B.B. King sings about. Nobody likes you but your mama, and she might be jiving you, too. Yeah. <laughs> you been there? Yeah. <laughs> well, all you're trying to change is the way that our society thinks about uh, the structure of business, the way we think about democracy and workers and wealth, the role of workers and the rewards of work, the relationship of business to consumers and to the larger community the way we think about power itself. The Italians have a great phrase, who bono, who benefits? And that's a question that the powers of be don't like us to ask. But you're not merely asking, you are acting uh, on it. You are trying to implement the uncorporate uh, society uh, in America. You're in a great American tradition. You are agitators. Now, the powers of be try to make that a majority, right? Oh, those union agitators. Our workers were perfectly happy in that fact, making minimum wage until those union organizers came in and started talking to them. The poor people didn't mind living up against that toxic waste dump until those environmental agitators came in and started messing with their minds. <laughs> well, both of them next to them. <laughs> agitation is not a pejorative at all. That is what built America. Were it not for agitators, we'd be wearing white powdered wigs, singing God Hail the Queen here tonight, wouldn't we? <laughs> agitation built America. And I don't mean just the founders of the country. There, there wasn't much democracy in that first election that chose George Washington. Only 4% of the people were even eligible to vote. You couldn't vote if you were a woman. African American, Native American. Uh, you couldn't vote if you did not own land. Democracy didn't come from the documents of the Declaration and the uh, Constitution and the Bill of Rights. It came from, instead, the generations of folks just like you who rose up and fought to democratize those documents. Thomas Paine and Daniel Shays, the abolitionists and the suffragists, uh, the Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass, uh, the People's Party and Labor Movement, Dorothy Day, Upton Sinclair, Mother Jones and Woody Guthrie, Martin Luther King, Cesar Chavez, and now down to you and me. We've got to be the agitators again to extend the democratic possibilities of this great nation. And when they say you're an agitator, you can say right back at them, yeah, that's the center post in the washing machine that gets the dirt out. <laughs> it's a good thing. <laughs> we count on agitation uh, in our country. And that's what I like about the cooperative movement is that it's a movement that actually moves. 
That's unique <laughs> in America. I, I love John McNamara over here laughing about that because he, he, they've been bogging in the Union Cap uh, Cooperative up in uh, Madison, uh, Wisconsin. They, their slogan is democracy in motion. Uh, and that's exactly right. Uh, Co-ops don't just talk about democracy. They don't hold protest rallies saying uh, uh, that we, we won't have, uh, don't let the big government take over our Medicare. <laughs> Co-ops give ordinary people a way to do democracy. When I, when I first moved to, to Austin uh, back in uh, 1976, uh, uh, there was a moving company there uh, that had a great uh, advertising slogan. I don't know, it's called something like, you know, Skeeter and Boger's Moving Company. <laughs> and, and, and they had a slogan, they had it in the, in the yellow pages, actually, and said, if we can get it loose, we can move it. <laughs> but that's what we're talking about uh, here. You are getting democracy loose uh, from the greedheads and boneheads, uh, from the conglomeratizers and the monopolizers, from the banksters and bosses, the big shots, the bastards, and the bullshitters who keep feeling that they are entitled to run roughshod over us. Roughshod over workers and small farmers, over the middle class as well as the poor. Roughshod over our air and our water and our food. Roughshod over our, Ameri over our America itself, those fundamental values of fairness, justice, and opportunity for all. They get to thinking they're the top dogs and we're just a bunch of fire hydrants, you know, out here in the countryside. <laughs> and we're seeing that now. What we're seeing is uh, up in the corporate suites uh, on Wall Street, uh, in the back rooms of Washington, is an assertion of oligarchy over democracy. It's nothing smaller than that. There's a coup taking place in our country, rather quietly, uh, in terms of the media attention and the political attention to it, a cold determination by the money to to that, uh, that they can separate their good fortunes from the well-being of the rest of us. Lily Tomlin has said that no matter how cynical you get, it's almost impossible to keep up. <laughs> and as we're experiencing uh, with the Wall Street uh, bailout, uh, the powers that be are busy displacing our nation's essential, uniting ethic of the common good with a new, pernicious ethic of greed. They say, I got mine, you get yours. Never give a sucker an even break, have it all empty, or I'm rich and you're not. Audio's chump, that's pretty much what they're saying uh, to us. For example, take Wall Street bankers, please. <laughs> You'd think these guys could buy a clue, right? <laughs> but, uh, but they don't. Uh, having crashed our economy, they're back to grabbing multi-billion dollar bonuses uh, for themselves. Bonuses generated by our bailout money. But wait, they cry, uh, we are generous, charitable people. Uh, we contribute to all sorts of philanthropic uh, causes. Goldman Sachs, earlier this year, after the CEO of Goldman Sachs declared that uh, he was doing God's work, <laughs> and after they declared that they were going to allocate $20 billion for the bonuses of their top executives, Goldman Sachs CEO came out and said, well, yes, but, uh, but we've set aside a billion dollars. We've created a new Goldman Sachs charity for the less fortunate in our society. Well, I'll tell you a quick story about what the gods think of charity. This, this actually comes from Earl Long. He was governor of Louisiana, his brother Huey. And Earl Long uh, talked about a rich man who died and tried to get into heaven. But if you went to the little Methodist church that I did in Denison, Texas years ago, you'd know that you just do not walk right into heaven. You've got to appear at the pearly gates. And there is going to be an angel who will review your life with you. And then St. Peter, sitting back behind the gates, will render the decision of whether or not you get to come through. And sure enough, here comes this rich man. Uh, and, uh, and the angel looks over his life and says, my God, you never did no good for nobody, no way. What the hell are you doing here? And, and the rich man said, well, now, wait a minute. That's not entirely true. There was that period, that time in 1924 when a widow woman needed a car fare home and I gave her a nickel. The angel said, so? 
And Rich Smith said, well, 1935, uh, there was that blind beggar man on the street, and I put a nickel in his cup. And the angel said, well, this doesn't make up for a life of greed. But the rich man said, no, wait a minute, I've got a consistent pattern of philanthropy back in 1945. Coming out of uh, my bank at, uh, at Christmas time, there was a Salvation Army kettle, and I put a nickel in there. And St. Peter turns, uh, the angel turns back to St. Peter and says, what the hell are we going to do with this man? And St. Peter said, give him back his 15 cents and tell him to go to hell. <laughs>